Hi, everybody. Good to see you again. I'm back. I, uh, I I looked, I took a quick look at the last week's live stream, and I realized that my Dr. Nick impression was pretty terrible because while it sounds like Dr. Nick in my head, it doesn't sound like Dr. Nick out in the air. So I'm real sorry about that. I won't do it again. All right, so we've got a couple of topics to cover before we can – I'm going to I'm gonna take questions as they come. Hang on a second. I'm going to try and get – some more of the H of the H H B S J people, the T F B people in here. Bruce isn't available today. So somebody asked me on Bookface a question that I should address. Who was that? Just let me pull up my phone here so I can monitor myself and make sure everything's working. And also I get to see the, the questions faster when they're coming through YouTube first. Watch me pick my nose. Okay, show me. Show me the chat. Okay, we look like we're doing it. Okay, what was the question that somebody asked me? Somebody commented on my post. Okay. Sharon asks... Would like to hear more about how you leave the boxes with harvested comb on the hive during the winter. I'm running out of storage room for comb and the wax moth issue. Also more info on big mega hives. Okay, so what she's talking about is I, when I extract or if I have empty comb, I will just put it back on the hive. I try not to store comb off the hive because uh, the number one reason, of course, is wax moths. Wax moths will tear up your comb. Uh, which if it's not too bad, the bees can fix. So it's, you know, here or there. Mm -hmm. So um, try to avoid storing comb because the typical way to store comb is using moth crystals. And that's a nasty, nasty chemical that we don't want in our homes or in our honey or in our wax. So we just try to avoid that. Um, when, when I, when I do have to store a comb, what I try to do is, uh, on my back porch, I will store it, uh, stacked vertically. The, the box is stacked on end on top of one another. So they're open to light and air on both sides. And that does pretty well. That's not going to completely stop a wax moth in fact, in infection, infestation, but it will, it will keep it down to a minimum at least as much so that the bees can re um, re fix it, redo it later. I've got all my tabs open right now, and I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, and now my is playing. Okay, still going along. Oh, look, we got some great questions coming up. Great, I'll get those in a minute. So. So most of the time I will try and put the empty comb back on the hive so that the bees can handle it because the bees can handle it. Um, things you want to wor worry about. You don't want to worry about anything. Things you want to pay attention to is you don't want to put just a big old stack of comb on a hive that's not big enough to patrol that area. You want 
um, the colony to be big enough so that at least it can have some bees patrolling around and taking care of wax moths. Uh, so, you know, probably no more than whatever's occupied in the hive, maybe 50% more than that is probably about the most you should do. Another thing is you don't want to separate, you know, in the fall, uh, a lot of people try to put like a box or during the honey season anyway, try to put a box of empty between a box that's full. If they don't fill that box completely up before fall, there's a good chance that they're going to get stuck down in that bottom section and they will not cross over that empty comb to get to that honey in the fall and they'll starve to death. So watch out for that. Um, and then the other, with, with just the large hives, mega hives, big hive, mega hives, that's fun, mega hives, uh, that's basically the idea that, <clears throat> I got that idea, kind of a combination of unlimited brood nest management, where we don't use queen excluders, we allow the queen and the, the colony to move up and down in the hive more like they would in nature because they do that throughout the year in the, in the spring, they're going to be up high because they've eaten up all the honey and the cluster has moved up into where the honey is. And then as they bring more honey in, they will push down the, the, the brood nest will be pushed down by the need to fill up more honey. Now, if you don't manage that at least a little bit, a lot of times they won't move down. They'll, that section will be full of brood and they'll want to swarm. But if you got plenty of space in the hive, I find swarming is much more reduced. I can't say for absolutely sure if this is the case, but my hypothesis is uh, just thinking in human terms. Remember, bees don't think like humans. They're not humans. Oh, geez, my hair's crazy. I haven't taken a shower this morning, so my hair isn't tamed yet. <clears throat> the, um, where was I? Completely lost it. <laughs> um, this is embarrassing. That's okay. I can be embarrassed on camera. I could probably go back and see where I was. Why? Every time I turn the phone, it switches orientation the wrong way. Oh, right. My hypothesis. Sorry for that delay. <clears throat> My hypothesis is that when a colony has a very large cavity and they go into, they come out of winter with a lot of space, they kind of take stock of what space they have and what space they need to fill in order to swarm coming up in a few months. And if they've got a huge amount of space and they sort of can't, aren't going to fill it, they'll put off swarming until the following year. And this is my hypothesis as to why bees want to swarm in the spring, even though they've been supered before the nectar flow. Because before you supered them, they've already decided whether they're going to swarm or not. So if you're using very large stacks or larger stacks of boxes, they are, they've already decided they're not going to swarm. So you don't have to worry about that so much. All right. Let's talk some of these questions. What's the greater threat to honeybees? Mites or lack of reliable untainted forage throughout the entire growing season? Hmm. I don't think mites are, are a threat at all. I think we've actually passed. Mites were a threat back in the early 90s before we got to the point where where bees are surviving without any intervention. I believe that bees 
in some areas at least did survive without intervention and therefore we never needed to treat at all. I can't prove that. It also can't be disproven, but, um, well, I guess I can prove it because my, my great uncle Wayne, who I've talked about regularly, he lived in a pocket Valley up in, uh, up outside of Roosh, Oregon. And he kept bees contiguously through the initial introduction of mites. And he lost about 95% of his colonies, but he didn't lose them all. And he never treated and he kept bees contiguously until I believe until he either died or until he was getting to the point where he was getting there. I think he died in, I don't know the exact year, 2005, six or seven in there somewhere. And uh, so that for me, that's, that's proof enough. Uh, I have found bees in a number of completely non um, un, unoccupied, no human areas up in the, up in the mountains here. And so I'm personally don't think mites are a threat at all. Um, forage is an issue. Uh, I might even say, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard without, without really good numbers to, to say exactly what's the biggest threat. Uh, loss of habitat, loss of cavities to live in is, is a threat. People are cutting down bee trees every day. It's, uh, it's kind of sad. I, if you if you can, if someone's trying to get you to to get the bees out of a tree, try and leave them there. You know, educate them. Tell them that the bees need this 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 habitat to survive. Hmm. Happy Friday to you also. Hello from Argentina. I'm guessing that's Argentina and not Argentina, Arkansas. AR is the abbreviation for Arkansas. I'm guessing by your name, you're probably from Argentina, Argentina. So that's good. Welcome. Your thoughts on single hive management. I don't think single hive management is going to work very well for most beekeepers. The uh, just on a statistics point of view, your your chances of losing any one hive in a year are, you know, forty to sixty percent. And so, uh, if you, the the more the greater number of hives that you have. The, the the you're going to reduce your chances of losing all your hives at once and it's much better much easier to return from losing a bunch of your hives at once uh I'm sorry it's it's much easier to build back from losing a few of your hives but not all of your hives than it is if you lose all of your hives so i recommend people people try to get just as many hives as you can but at least 5 because you want to be able to in case something bad happens, you have a really bad winter or a really bad storm or whatever happens, you want to be able to build back. And if you lose all your colonies, that's going to be really hard. How long are your feral bees lasting on average before they die or leave? What are your winter loss for like? I want to get away from these numbers. Um, this is the old conventional beekeeping paradigm, the, uh, the commercial farming beekeeping paradigm. Um, and I don't think these are that important. Firstly, what's the best way to say this? Having a, having a colony or an individual or any animal in nature survive for the longest length of time is not necessarily what will allow that species to survive and evolve in nature. For instance, uh, opossums have evolved to not have a very long lifespan at all, like less than four years. Like rat, rats live longer than opossums. 
what they do is they they eat everything, which it's it's hard to eat everything and survive a long time because your food's food's of terrible quality and you're eating really nasty things. Um, and then they have a lot of young. So their survival strategy for the species is to reproduce a lot and don't worry about living a long time. Um, so the length of time a colony lasts is not that important. Now where it is important is going to be the further north you go because the further north you go, the fewer chances you're going to have to swarm every year. You're going to be um, above a certain latitude, a colony is only going to be able to swarm once. And so it's going to be really necessary for that colony to survive year after year after year to keep producing swarms, to keep reproducing. And the further north you go, you might even get to the point where, like I mentioned earlier, if you've got a large enough cavity, a colony might only be able to generate a swarm large enough to survive once every other year. So living a long time to be able to reproduce is what's important, not just living a long time. Um, my winter losses are, again, I don't think this paradigm, this way of looking at it is, is all that important. Uh, I will tell you for curiosity's sake, the longest hive that I've ever had lived, lived 10 and a half years. Um, of course, many of them are splits and die the first year. So it is what it is. Winter losses. I usually like to have between five to 20%, I think is good and sustainable. Uh, my highest ever was like 70%. Um, but I don't think these numbers are important and I don't think we should focus on them. And I honestly don't think we should compete on a paradigm that we don't subscribe to anymore. Can you speak to 10 frame versus eight frame management requirements? Turn my phone back on here so I can see what's going on. Yes. Possum bees. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with eight frame management. Uh, I've only had one eight frame hive in my life and I ended up selling it because it, you know, all the rest of them are 10 frame. I don't think there's a huge different ma difference in management, you know, to get the same area of comb, you're going to have to stack more boxes up. Um, I think the bees cluster size will push out more to the edges. That's what I've been told by Michael Bush. Uh, but I don't think there's a huge big difference in management requirements. I could be wrong. Somebody can correct me. Norseman honey is in Canada and they shed their hives in winter and heat the shed to plus four Celsius, which is around 40, 30, what is it? 38, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So yes, I've heard that before. Um, and that's done. I mean, you're the one that does it, so you can, you're the expert on it, but um, <clears throat> that's done to keep bees from flying, to keep them in a constant temperature so that they will remain uh, motile, remain moving on the comb. If they get too cold, they'll be, they'll be stuck and they won't, they won't move because they're, um, not warm enough to move, uh, depending on depending on the uh, strain of bee. And I say strain not is like a specific branded strain. Different, just any different colony of bees is going to have different capabilities just based on genetics. So they keep the bees at a steady temperature that's below the temperature where they can fly, and then you you put all of your colonies. In a, in a regime where they consume honey at approximately the same rate. And so they can, you can work much better. You're not affected by the conditions. You're not going to have like a big storm or, or cold and, and fluctuations in temperature. Everything's going to stay steady state. And then when it's okay to bring the bees out, they bring them out again. Um, now, I don't know your situation with feral bees and what what if bees are able to survive out in nature there 
like I say, with all treatments and manipulations, whatever you're doing to a hive, you are selecting, whatever you're doing to a population, you're selecting that population to require that intervention. Jimmy Gallup, I assume he's talking about putting uh, boxes on the bottom for supering, under supering, which is fine. That's typically how um, war a hives are done. So no problem there. Whatever works for you, I'll be keeping as local. Nick says, all mites... Mites are a non-issue in my apiaries. We did lose entire out yards this week due to some type of poison. Man-made products do the most damage, in my humble opinion. I would absolutely agree with that. Right now, um, man-made chemicals are doing a lot of damage. Um, I lost an entire yard two winters ago due to... It wasn't even quite winter. It was fall. And it appeared to be a pesticide kill. So yeah, that's that. I, I would agree. the The most likely candidate for the the most danger is from pesticides. Pesticide kills, pesticide buildup, and wax. It's all bad. Okay, I think we've run out of questions for right now. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about yesterday I was uh, I was on a, a video call with um, Robin Underwood, who is doing a project, I forget the exact name, but it's abbreviated COMB. I think you can find it at COMB Project, what is it? Yeah, it's at uh, lopezuribelab.com slash comb. And it stands for Conventional and or Organic Management of Bees, which is kind of a, a misnomer because it's conventional and organic and chemical-free management of bees. Um, anyway, so she gave us an update on the project, and uh, Dr. Lopez Uribe also gave us an update on some of the other research that they've been doing. They've been doing other projects within this project to test comb and uh, for, for pesticides, which it doesn't seem like, um, I, I could be misremembering, but it seems like uh, honeybees um, from the environment collect the same pesticides more or less. There was an interesting, in their testing, they did show that the, the treated bees collected different pesticides than the untreated bees, which was, was interesting. So they'll have to do some more, some more experiments to figure out why that is and, and where that's coming from. But my, uh, Oh, the results, I think they have, They don't have results for this winter yet, the 2020-2021 the winter. Uh, previous winter, the, the first winter they had losses like in 50% range or something, or somewhere in there. Second winter was a little lower for the for the untreated stuff. Of course, the treated stuff did did better, which you'd expect. I mean, if treatments didn't work, people wouldn't use them. Um. But my question would be, why don't you stop treating all of them and see who survives then? Um, so my main concern with the, the the study, and and you can hear this in the podcast that I did with, in the videos that I did with uh, did with Robin, is that you don't even reach a steady state, in my view in treatment-free beekeeping until the third or fourth year. So you're not measuring the difference between treated bees and untreated bees. You're measuring a acclimation period, 
which in science is not valid in my view. Um, the problem with a lot of studies is they often start out with package bees. As so they start out with a bunch of treated package bees and then they treat some of them, which is what they're accustomed to, and they don't treat other ones, which is totally out of, out of their comfort zone. And then it's no surprise when the untreated ones die. Um, meanwhile, you know, in my experience, and I've done this three or four times, you start out with a population of bees, even if you just move them to somewhere where they, where they're not acclimated to, you know, you can, you can already have good treatment for your bees. You move them and they are no longer, um, acclimated anymore. And then let me add Rupert here for a minute. Rupert, are you there? Hang on, let me get my headphones. Are you there? Can you hear me? Oh, his, his microphone's muted. Oh, he's muted on his end. So, Rupert, if you can hear me, you're muted on your end. I don't know what, what you need to do there. Anyway, um, you start out with treated bees. You don't treat them. They die. This is not a surprise to any of us. Um, but what happens if you if you stop treating all of them? Then then the treated ones are going to die even worse than the untreated ones. And so, in my experience, it takes uh, three to at least three to four years to even get to a steady state where the beekeeping population of your area has adapted enough to be able to survive on their own. And so if you have an experiment lasting less than five years, to me, that's not valid. It's not scientific because you're not testing things on an equal playing field. Hang on, I got to blow my nose. So we don't want to do that. Um, if we were going to do a shorter term experiment in that case, I would want to do something like get one of uh, somebody like Nick, who's got over uh, over a hundred hives, a hundred colonies and just sort of take over an operation like that. Say, Hey, Nick, uh, we're going to, we're going to watch your operation. We're going to modify what you're doing. Say, a third of your hives, we're going to keep doing the same thing that you've been doing. Another third, we're going to treat organically. And another third, we're going to treat conventionally. And we're going to measure the differences. And see, that to me would be a valid short-term experiment because you're working with steady state conditions. Turn off. But no one has ever done that. They always want to start with, start with junk-treated bees. Um, and I don't want to start with junk treated bees. I want to start with good bees. There's no reason why we can't start with bees that are already doing what we need them to do. And then just check the differences. Now I would fully expect in a situation like that, um, Nick's bees are going to continue to be, to do what they normally do with their normal loss rates and things. And then probably the treated bees are going to do better. I'm not, I'm not questioning that outcome. I think that that's most likely because as with anything, you know, uh, you, t you take a normal guy and you give him steroids, he's going to get bigger, right? It's, it's, you take, you take animals, you give them, um, antibiotics, they're going to grow faster because, their bodies don't have to fight the same way anymore. So that's what treating does. But what we're going for as treatment-free beekeeper, beekeepers is a sustainable population where inputs aren't required. Because if, if I stop treating my bees, they're going to continue to not be treated, they're going to be fine. If you take treated bees and stop treating them, a lot of them are going to die. You ever worried that people try to push laws to enforce treating across the U.S., or is that something we shouldn't be concerned about? It's something we should be concerned about. Um, 
I don't, I mean, there's, there's enough people that don't treat and a lot of people don't realize that the beekeeping industry is kind of dying and has been dying for quite a while because nobody wants to replace the commercial beekeepers as they get old and retire and die because it's a, it's a, it's a terrible job. It's, it's hot and hard and there's a huge chance for, um, there's a huge chance for failure and uh, profit loss with anything that, that goes on. It's been, you know, many, many commercial beekeepers have gone out of business in the last, well, since for all, in the last 30 years. And it doesn't seem to be getting a whole lot better because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a good industry. It's kind of a terrible situation. Um, but that doesn't mean that people aren't going to try to enforce treating. There are some states that, that have laws about treating. And in those cases, I would say um, if there is an unjust law, then you have my permission on your own moral recognizance not to follow it. Um, you take the risk of prosecution and punishment, but that's the risk that you take. Uh, we're all adults. We can decide whether or not to follow the rules and to weather the consequences such as life. It's like if you, if you're driving and you go over the speed limit, probably not going to get caught on any given day, but you might. So it's up to you. You know, who, who is, I think, um, Thomas Jefferson said that originally was about uh, we have a moral right or responsibility not to follow unjust laws. But again, like with civil disobedience, you can't disobey the law and expect not to be caught and punished. It's up to you. You, you take, take your life in your own hands. We should oppose these things if they come up. We should oppose them. But um, that's that's democracy. That's the system in which we live. It's it's good for us to be um, active in our communities and in in our states and and wherever laws are passed. It's good for us to be active and to make our voices heard and try not to allow those things to happen. Nick says, I've never treated. Would that skew the data? What about comparing swarms from treated hives versus non-treated hives? Well, that was another suggestion of mine was you could take over somebody's operation like Bruce, where his is based completely on catching swarms. Um, you could take over like a valley, you know, like say, say Bruce's, Bruce's stomping grounds, the areas that he's willing to drive to to catch swarms. If you if you said, okay, this area now is our experiment area. We're going to catch as many swarms from this area. We're going to keep the bees in this area. We're going to we're going to maintain this this biome here, and we're going to do we're going to keep uh, statistics. We're going to keep records and and do experiments within that environment. So I, I think the major failure is with um, the major failure is with the application of the scientific method to beekeeping with with the the incorrect application of the scientific method to beekeeping all right rupert's here let's bring rupert in hi there can you hear me i can hear you fine i've been i've been listening but i was just having my tea so um, i didn't want you to be watching that or listening to it <laughs> Don't want to listen to you slurping. Yeah, <laughs> well, we're, we're all good now. Nice. Well, everybody, uh, this is Rupert. He's I don't know how much how much uh, information you want to be public, but you're one of our TFB moderators. Okay, just get myself set up. 
Could you turn down your speaker volume a little bit? As, much, as, as low as you can get and still hear it? Um, Getting a little bit of feedback. Okay, I can't see where to do that. Sorry about this. That's fine. Just your, your regular computer output. So no, I was just, is that any better? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm not hearing myself anymore. That's good. You can still hear me? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. It's a bit faint, but that'll be fine. Great. Uh, so do you have any thoughts on what I was just talking about with the application of the scientific method to beekeeping? Of the scientific method? Yeah. I was uh, just... Go ahead. I, d I don't know which particular method you're talking about. Well, I'm talking about... Um, People trying to do science with bees when they're not starting they're not starting all the treatment groups on an equal playing field. You know, when they start with when they try to do a treatment free experiment using yeah. uh, treated bees. And so they start with with packages because they think, okay, we gotta start everybody on the same footing. So we're gonna start with packages all from the same source. But the problem is the packages are already treated, and that doesn't seem to me to be a fair right. comparison. Okay, okay, I know what you're talking about. Um, no, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a balanced way to do it at all because you're you're basically trying to force the force them to go treatment free immediately, and I think you really need to have the bees two or three years down the line. They would have been be they would have been better to get. Um, established bees that are living treatment free for at least two years before they start it or else they're, they're not they're not going to fare, fare as well yeah and another one that i was thinking about a few years ago i wanted to do i, I try to do a um a gofundme to try and do a a, a small cell test because the thing that i've seen with all the small cell experiments was that they would start with large bees and so instead of really testing the difference between small cell and large cell, you're actually testing the, the attempted transition period to go from large cell yeah. to small cell, which is a whole other thing. And so my idea was it's much easier to go from small cell to large cell. So why don't you just start with small cell bees and then move some of them up to large cell. And then you can start your experiment on a much more level playing field. Yeah, well, if you if you looked at it the other way, um, if you do that, then the population of bees that you're drawn from have all been treated for years and yeah, years and years. That that also. Uh, so the, I I think the way the way to do it is that you go to guys like yourself or Bruce, and you say we need ten colonies or fifty colonies, whatever the number. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and then you've got you've got a fair starting point because what 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 they're doing is they're they're taking bees that have been treated for years and years with whatever, so they're they're not true bees. Um, so so yeah, I think if they're getting packages from somewhere to start off with, so why not go to a treatment free keeper for the treatment free bees, and then just take it from there I, do, yeah. I, don't, I don't really see what I don't really see why that wasn't an, an option I think part of it is because there aren't a lot of uh, treatment free bees on tap to start with uh, which which kind of confuses me also because I've I've interviewed a number of either commercial beekeepers or sideline beekeepers, treatment free beekeepers on the podcast who are, you know, above or well above at least a hundred hives. And so if you could start with, start with one 
unit one operation like that and go from there, I feel like you'd be starting on, on good footing for a good experiment. Um, and you know, it's not, I have no problem with the science. I have the problem with, with how the science is, is applied. Yeah. They, they could have, uh, for instance, like the treatment free beekeepers group, you could have gone there and said, does anyone want to donate or sell uh, five nukes for our experiment? And then you would have a broad range. You wouldn't have them all from Bruce or yourself. You would have lots of people donating one or two. Um, I, I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if Americans are as charitable as <laughs> as you guys over there. Well, well, you could you could you could buy them. I mean, I I take it they're I take it they're paying people. They're not going to a commercial beekeeper and saying we need two hundred nukes for nothing. So that must no, they're. Be that They're must buying the budget that they buy them all, so just buy them off treatment free and that. I think the main thing is they want to have bees that are uh, sort of local to that area or at least a similar climate. And but they could, they, could, they could do it. It needs, it needs to be a, a representative pool to start with. But there they, lies another part of the problem is that the the experiment starts on like the day the bees show up and unless you're working with bees like from your own yard you're you're bringing bees into a foreign environment they're not going to be acclimated yeah. to your area and so you're you're again not getting a good comparison of of your treatment groups and treatment meaning for those listening treatment is the different way the different experiment groups they're called treatment groups it's, it's not the 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 treatment free treatment group is a treatment group but it's not treated so that's something to remember um but the problem is you know like with with robin's study it was a two-year study and so you don't have two or three years to get your bees acclimated you, you you just kind of got to jump into it, and that's a function of the way the funding works. And everybody wants everything done quickly. And that's kind of how we are in the modern world. Todd, could you send us a link to whatever study you're talking about with uh, Dr. Roden or whoever? I don't. I'm not familiar with that study, unless you're talking about Robin. Robin didn't, it's kind of claimed that Robin started out with treatment-free queens, but they weren't really. They were, they were queens who were the daughter, daughters of a treatment, or a couple treatment-free queens. I forget if it was a couple or just one. But they were mated in a commercial yard. So it's not optimal. Uh, just to... Go back to the question we had earlier. Are you familiar with Saskatraz, I assume is what he's calling bee strain? I'm familiar with it. I don't have any. I haven't seen any in person. Um, I am not a big believer in honeybee strains. I want to, I don't believe in shipping or hauling bees. They should, bees are meant to be stationary. Trees don't move, you know, trees don't go to, almonds in January. So I don't think bees should either. And, you know, give us another 10 or 20 years and we're going to start seeing a lot more self-pollinated almonds. So the beekeeping industry, as we know it, is getting ready to take another huge turn very shortly. Todd says he's talking about Robin. So I guess, yeah, we're, in, we're on the same page now. I think, I think it's got a Y in it. Well, that's okay. Say again? I think it's R-O-B-Y-N. Yeah, it's R-O-B-Y-N. Uh, Charles says, I would think both beekeepers, treatment-free and treaters, would give up a split early in the spring, then move the splits 30 miles away to an open field and go from there, if only to see the results. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, some people will do things like that. Again, the, the concern that I have is that we're not starting – in a steady state. Whatever we need to do, we need to bring these together, bring all these bees together and manage them where they sit for two or three years 
so they they level off and they get to be what they're going to be, and then we can do tests on them. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing. No one wants to wait for two or three years, but to make it fair, that's what you'd have to do. John Chambers, you, you watched the video of John Chambers, I think. Yes. Basic honeybee genetics, um, and he had that. He quoted that experiment they did in France, where they moved bees from Paris down to the south of France and vice versa. Yes. And he said that not only did they not build up for the for the flaws, uh, one of them had a distinct two flaws and one of them had one single flaw. And they were still building up at the wrong time, even years after, even five years after. So you, they, they don't manage it. You'd have, you would have to, you'd have to find somewhere that has similar foraging yes and a similar climate similar altitude everything or or else you leave them for five years and do your experiment from there which you could do there's no reason people plant trees you can you can do things long term um, yeah people at the, at the moment we've got what we've got and hopefully hopefully it comes up with are we talking specifically about robin underwood's study yeah, um, I think I think the thing to be said about it is that um, although it may not be perfect, it's still a pretty good thing. I think it's, I think we're taking the bad side of it, and I think if you'd started all with treatment-free bees, they lived there. People would be complaining that this isn't fair because you're suddenly treating untreated bees. Like we're we're just getting the bad side of it, and it. There's a few things I've noticed. I haven't seen anything recently from from it, but there are, there have been a few things that are not very scientific, and I think also they're maybe looking at too many variables. There are, I think, too many variables. The I would the reason why I'm suggesting starting with treatment-free bees is because I think treatment-free bees would be doing just that much better, and so. I don't think there would be as many complaints from the treaters because the treated bees are still going to do better. They're still going to claim that the treated bees survive better, survive. It's kind of funny. Bruce was on the call yesterday talking about how he, he hates when people use the word survive because treated bees don't survive. Treated bees are helped to, to live. You know, they, they don't, in the strict definition of survival, they're not surviving. They're being propped up, was his point. Yeah, well, I agree. I agree. Um, it, I, I didn't. I didn't go to that. I couldn't. I couldn't find it. I was looking for it a day early, and I. I just gave up. Yeah, they had the wrong. The, this was the. This was the. Um, announcing the results or something was it? Uh, there weren't any really any new results because uh, she doesn't have the the losses from this current winter yet. Okay. So just kind of like a recapitulation, it, and they did they, they were talking about some of the results, new results from pesticide testing and and stuff like that. The one conclusion she did come up with, which which I think is a is a big step in the right direction, is she no longer is in favor of conventional treating. She is now in favor of uh, organic treatment regimes because, according to her study, conventional and organic basically have the same the same outcome. So I think it's a it's a good step in the right direction, you know. It's it's reduced comb issues, reduced chemicals. Uh, some of those chemicals are really nasty. Kumafos is a really dangerous, nasty chemical, like a a nerve agent or something. It's it's really bad. People die of it from overdoses every year because it's still used as a pesticide in Europe. I don't know if it's here in the U.S. And and does she does she include uh, oxalic acid and the Organic section. I believe so. Like a, in a dribble or something. I think it was a dribble, yeah. 
Um, okay, well, the, I think that might be problematic. I, I think the or, the organic thing is. Um, is it, I, I think it's probably a step in the right direction. It's at least admitting that some of the things are is is ruling out some of the treatments, and it's a step in the right direction. But I think it's still interference that stops yeah. doing their own uh, selection or having selection, selective pressure on them. It's eliminating the worst of the worst. It's like it's like it's like stopping burning coal while you're still burning. Yeah, uh, natural gas. It's better. It's not great, but it's still better. Yeah. Well, at least it shows people are thinking about it. Yeah. And I think personally that, that people who are on an organic track are much more likely to dabble in treatment free. Yeah. So that, that I think would also be a step in the right direction. Because uh, I use or I use oxalic acid for uh, wood bleach, and it's um, although, although you could call it organic, um, it's pretty dangerous stuff to be dealing with. You don't want to be inhaling it. Yeah. You don't. You don't really want it on your hands. So, like you could say, it's natural. It's or it's organic. Everything like that. But I still don't. Still, wouldn't want to anywhere near bees, well, or anything living. Well, yes, I mean that's the purpose of um, chemicals that that come from plant. You know, like well, any sort of uh, tree sap or essential oil, they are sort of the plant's natural pesticides. We're just yeah. we're just concentrating them and using them on a different pest. They are not good for living things, or not of the animal variety anyway. Let's see, was there anything else? Oh, one of the things she was talking about, which kind of exposes her biases, was um, she was talking about organic treatments and the, the certified orga organic certifications, which kind of put a, what would I want to call that? Kind of a moral imperative on <clears throat> preventing, preventing suffering in animals. And she was talking about how she, when she sees a hive that's, that's crashing of mites, that she interprets that as, a as suffering and i was i was kind of unhappy with that point of view because those that sort of moral imperative to prevent suffering really came from livestock management and i mean i'll just say it mammals it's it's a mammal thing um bees I do not believe bees suffer in the same way that mammals do. And especially, especially when you consider that a bee's lifespan is six weeks and that, you know, thousands of bees are being born and die every day in every single colony. And um, they get eaten by birds and, they get, and all the other stuff. And then the other point that I, I made was that, you know, you may be concerned about the suffering of the bees, but you're not concerned about the suffering of the mites that you're killing. So to me, it's, it's all kind of inconsistent. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's true. I, I don't know. I don't know how to compare the suffering of bees to, uh, human suffering. Um, because it, I mean, some of the things that go through is pretty brutal when you're doing an experiment and you see some of them that have been cut in half by a bit of clumsiness and, that you just you've just got a head and thorax running around with wings, yep. Um, or or seeing drones that have just mated. I mean, they, I don't I don't know how much pain they feel, but they do seem to go through it. And I don't know what it'd be like if you looked at um, if you looked at humans, you might think, well, that's just what they do. 
if you looked at humans going into World War Two or something like that, you'd just be like, well, it's just what humans do. Um, yeah, if you look at it from from the perspective of like an extraterrestrial or some yeah creature that's on a higher level, they're looking at down at you know the battle but, of the I think World War Two. Like, look, the humans just like to kill each other. That's yeah, that's interesting. And I think having a a nozzle connected to a car battery and filling the whole environment with oxalic oxalic acid fumes must be hellish. And as far as I can see, the they just close down their spiracles and basically hold their breath until it's gone. Yeah, they don't seem to like it, do they? Uh, I don't. I don't think they like a lot. A lot of these things. Well, it's, it's anything alien in the in the hive is not going to be good for them. Whether it's the smells from essential oils or strips of things from chemicals, the first thing they want to do is get rid of that. They want to out of the hive. Anything that doesn't have their smell, they they want rid of it. I think of it, here's, here's the way that I think of it in terms of suffering. Now, if I, were, if I were butchering a goat or something, I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely going to, to put it, render it insensate. I'm going, to, I'm going to kill it or whatever as humanely as possible so that it is no pain, and then I'm going to butcher it, right? With bees, I'm not doing a single thing that they're not already going to experience as part of nature. They already have mites. They already get eaten by birds. They're already going to die of starvation just normally. This is how, how life goes for them. I'm not causing them any extra pain by not preventing mites. They've got all sorts of other things they can die from anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and and they've got all sorts of other mites, and they've they've had mites for millions of years. It's just part of what they do. It's like monkeys having fleas in their backs. It's just they pick them out and they just they just deal with it. Um, so uh, we've got a question there. Yeah, Daniel asks. I have three hives. Caught in July and swarm traps all are in double deeps. What's the best management to keep my apiary at five hives or less? I would say the easiest way to keep your hi your apiary at five colonies or less is in fall, whatever number you have over five, just reduce them, uh, com combine the weak ones with better ones. Or um, st keep keep more going into winter and you'll you're bound to lose some and then in spring you'll have five again you know instead of instead of trying to get up to five you can you can you know be just be be a little more relaxed and be kind of working back down to five i started off with three hives um i don't know about a good few years ago now um and they were so busy in May, June, um, building up so quickly. And I had I had the nuke boxes that they'd come in, and I split them into those. And then I got another hive, and I used old hives and what have you. And very soon I was up to uh, eight or something. And I just thought this this can never this can never carry on. I've, got, I've not got enough equipment. And it was just a scramble to get things to put them in. Um, but it's only really May and June that you have that kind of increase. So I would say you, t you take it up as, as often as they need splitting, then just split them. Um, and by the end of the year, just go through with what you've got. I was sure I would have about 20, 20 or 30 hives that was going so crazy in May. Um, but it is only that kind of swarming season that everything seems so crazy. So I would say make sure you've got enough uh, to make up another four or five. And like Solomon says, put, put them in together going into winter. Or just leave them all and you'll probably lose a few anyway. It's no bad thing to go in. I, th I think, for me, I think that between six and ten is a manageable 
is a manageable size, I can go into the apiary and within an hour I can do whatever I need to do. Anything more than that, I think you're you're starting. It's more like a job, and I don't I don't do it as a job. It's just it's just a hobby. Yeah. yeah. Once you start but, having to do multiple yards and stuff, it, it it takes on another level of complexity. Yeah. Well, I've got I've got three, no, four separate yards now, um, and you do feel like you're traveling around. We do. We don't get very many hot days. We only maybe get about fifteen days in the summer that are suitable for beekeeping. So you have to go around all of them if you get if you get a good day. So it means that you have a bit of a intensive time. But my advice would be keep the boxes. If you bought them as nukes and they came in these nuke boxes, use those for splits. Uh, make yourself some rudimentary hives just so you've got somewhere to put them. Doesn't have to be anything special. Um, and just see where you are come autumn or fall. Uh, and you'll be fine. Yep. Uh, Yolanta says, Hello from London, Ontario, Canada. What is your view on Nozema Sereni? Is it a quiet killer and a growing problem? My view is that I completely ignore it. Um, if it's a growing problem, it's probably because um, it's probably because it's being treated for. If it were ignored, the bees would adapt and to be able to deal with it, which I believe they do. Um, so I've, for me, the reason a colony dies is not really that important. It died, it's done. I'm going to work with the ones that are still alive. So, and, and for me, that's pretty much the same with all, uh, the same with all diseases, with all dead hives. I don't think it's a growing problem. Is it a growing problem? I, I don't, I don't think it is. Um, my feeling was that because so many people are treating the bees, they're kind of wiping out the nosema as well. Um, and I, I think it was a bigger problem before, before Varroa came on. And I think maybe, maybe people are just so much more worried about the Varroa that they've forgotten about it. Or maybe it's killing hives, and it could it could be a quiet killer, but um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, people like to cut their bees open and put, put it under a microscope and have a, a look at the slides, um, which seems to work. But I, I don't know. I've I've had colonies that seem to have had that um, all the signs, but I didn't put it under a microscope. Uh, but it didn't kill them. Uh, they, they survived. Um, yeah, that's kind of the way that I I treat most things. It's like, well, this one's got this one's got uh, deformed wing, and this one's that one's dead, and there was a bunch of mites in there, so it's probably mites. But you know, what am I going to do about it? It's it's the bee's job to stay alive. Not it's not my job to keep them alive. I had a. Uh, I know I'm cold and dead inside. <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've seen the formed wing a few times. I had a, I had a young guy. There's a thing they do here with the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, which is is like just. Do you know it? Is I've heard of it. Yeah. Is it? It's just like. Um, they have to do. They have to do a project and prove that they've spent their summer fruitfully. So I, I did it for a couple of people, and uh, well, it's quite amazing having a 14, 15 year old looking at your bees because their eyes are so much better than mine. Mm. He was like, "Oh, what's wrong with that one's wings?" And I was like, "All oh, right, it was deformed wing virus." And he's like, "Well, I killed them all." And I says, "Well, we'll, we'll see. Like, we'll come. We'll come back next week." And it might be that you find more and more and more, but we never did. There was there was a few, and that's all I've that's all I've seen is you do an inspection and you maybe find four or five or something. Um, but again, 
the the colonies didn't die from that. It was just a noticeable thing. Um, and it, I think it's a good um, a good example for uh, not treating your bees as well because the deformed wing virus. I think there's I think there's at least three variants of it now. Yeah, and it's, de it's developed so that um, basically so they don't kill off their hosts. Uh, and I think they have the super infection exclusion that uh, if you have C, you can't get A. So if you have the one that is asymptomatic, uh, it'll stop you getting the one that kills the bees. And it shows how most of these diseases will go in a in a downward curve because no parasite wants to kill all of its hosts. Um, anyway, we go off we go off the to topic a bit because we were talking we were talking about um, we weren't talking we weren't talking about that. But yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not too worried about. It these diseases um, and I, I think it's all selective pressure and if they're not exposed to it, they won't they won't get over it all smile says ludicrously said bees job to stay alive I don't know if you're agreeing with me or disagreeing with me but I don't care either way <laughs> 18 B says I'm fairly new to beekeeping are treatment and feeding a hot topic because of a desire to maintain bees for profit? Yes and no. There is a desire to maintain bees for profit, and a lot of times people try to try to make a profit off of bees, even on a small scale, which I think is a bit misguided, especially in the first, say, at least three years, um, because you think, if, if you're thinking of it like a pet, then, um, you know, you don't expect your dog or your cat to make a profit. Um, but people, people get bees and they expect to be making a profit within two or three years. And it's just not a reasonable expectation. Um, <clears throat> but I would say for most backyard beekeepers, it's, it's not necessarily profit. I think of it more as a sense of avoiding losing your investment. Because if you just spent, you know, several hundred dollars or pounds, as the case may be, on on new hives, and then you then you buy bees, and that's a couple hundred more dollars. The more money you spend on something, the more you're wanting to protect your investment. It's like having home insurance. If you own something big and expensive, you want to have some. You're gonna want to pay a little bit to keep it from keep from losing it, which is understandable, and which is why. Uh, our work as treatment-free beekeepers is a little, little bit more difficult to educate people to the fact that it's better for everybody if the bees aren't treated. All Smile says he's strongly disagreeing. He or she is strongly disagreeing, which is fine. I mean, <laughs> you know. It's, it's, I don't believe it's human's job to keep animals alive. I, I think it should be human's responsibility to not kill things, you know, um, of all the species that we humans have driven extinct. I think we shouldn't have done that. But if an animal or a species is unable to compete and, and dies of natural causes, then that's really their problem. Is our responsibility as APUs to assist bees to maintain the life of the colony? Nope. It isn't. It's the bees' job to stay, stay alive. That's all I can say about that. If your sole purpose is to make money, I would recommend real estate, not beekeeping. Yes, if you're trying to make money, beekeeping is not the way to do it. Beekeeping is not a very profitable industry. It's I, I can't I keep trying to explain to people when they when they start a new product or something, you know, I've known so many people and just, you know, I've been doing this for 18 years. I've known so many people that come up with a come up with a business plan and a business idea and they put so much work into it. And I'm just going, guys, there's no money in beekeeping. 
you know, the, the, the guy who came up with the flow hive, he didn't, he didn't sell that to existing beekeepers. He figured out a way to convince non beekeepers that beekeeping was easy and then sold them the way to make beekeeping easy. And he made a, a crap pile of money and like, where is it now? It's not really going anywhere. I think, I think it did. I think it did well. And I, I think, um, I think that kind of thing happens in every kind of industry. Someone comes to make it easier and you get all these gadgets and you get bread makers because people don't want to need the dough. So someone makes a gadget for it and that's what they've done. There, there do seem to be a lot of beekeepers um, that use them and like them. I, can, I just can't imagine it working. There's too much plastic in it that looks like it's just going to break after it gets properly up. Yeah, I've come to the con conclusion, I forget how many years ago, but it's been quite a while. If you want to make money in beekeeping, sell stuff to beekeepers. You cannot yeah. make big in beekeeping unless you, you, you can't. You can inherit something and you can make an, make a living from it. But unless you're coming up with something big to sell to beekeepers or in the case of the flow hive, big to make new beekeepers and then sell them stuff, it's just not going to happen. There's no money in beekeeping. So Secure Acres here says exactly what my position is. We should be keeping bees in a way that humans were ever gone. They could survive on their own. That's exactly it. If I died off my hives in the backyard are going to be no different. They're going to swarm. They're going to go in the trees. It's they're fine. There's not going to be a big deal. If I'm not there to treat them, they're not going to do anything different than if, than if I am here. Yeah. And, and if, uh, if we all suddenly died, then um, laws, laws of the treated bees would survive, but there would be a huge decimation. And there would be a few survivors, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy that um, they'll survive after us. They survived before us. So. All Smile says ludicrously. Said. I love this word ludicrously because like all I can think of is like uh, the, the Tesla cars have a, have a ludicrous speed or, you know, like it was um, space balls. Ludicrous speed was really fast. So. I, I just can't take that as an insult. It's just it's too funny. Charles says, why treat of dollars are your motive? Treating eats into an already razor thin margin for profit. That's true. The difference, especially on a commercial frame of reference, is that you're making so much money on, on pollination that, you know, I, I forget what the numbers are. It's in the range of, was it 150 bucks or I forget. Uh, per, per hive. Hang on. Yeah, the numbers are getting super high because, okay, it's currently about 150 per hive. Yeah. According I think, to I think, I think they, they make, they make on that. And they make on selling the honey, and they make make on selling the packages and nukes. Okay, according to 2020 numbers, they said we asked nine almond growers what they're paying per hive. The results are low 140, high 215, average 195. So average 195, 195 dollars per hive. So if you've got if you're running 10,000 hives, which is kind of the size for a normal commercial operation that does pollination, you know, that's a serious amount of money to work with. Now, a lot of that money goes in, you know, that's, that's two or three months worth of work. And a lot of that money goes into feeding. There's tons of feeding. They feed so much. They, uh, must, they must have to, is the almonds uh, in March or something, March or April, is it? They generally start going down there in January. They'll, a lot of them will make multiple trips with trucks and they'll stage out big groups of hives. You'll see if you're driving along the highway, especially on I-5, 
out in these grassy areas, you'll see these big groups of hives sitting around. And then they'll go in and once they've staged all their hives there, then they'll, they'll move them to different spots. Cause you only need, I forget how many hives you need per acre, but then they set them out in the, in the orchards. But it's a funny, funny industry. There's a lot of stealing going on too. Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen that. A lot of people get hives stolen. Lots of hives stolen, even full truckloads. Well, it makes sense if, if people know if people know that they can sell they can sell nukes for about the same price as about the same price as a nuke. About one hundred and fifty dollars or something. Yeah, two hundred dollars. If people know that and they know how to deal with them and they're all sitting on pallets, then it makes sense that people will go and steal them. Um, so you see several operations now paint their hives weird neon colors to try and prevent them from being stolen, so that they're all just white. I think it's about. I think it's about half the hives in in the U.S. are going to pollination services. Can't, I can't remember the exact figures, but it, it's millions. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the numbers have changed. It's the, the numbers have been reduced pretty significantly in the past 10 years. It's, it's gone like half. It used to be more than 5 million. I think it's more in the 2.5 to 3 million range now. Right. Nick says, great analogy is the guy selling feed and not raising the actual animals. Most of the gadgets and beekeeping catalogs are of no use to treatment-free beekeeping. That's true. No, I wouldn't say most. I mean, we can, I read through the catalog when it comes every, every winter. And there are lots of fun gadgets and stuff that would be fun to have or play with. But for the most part, yeah, most of the stuff we just don't need. Charles says, responsible dog breeders do not breed their animals if they have defects. Yes, that's true. They breed animals that are as close to perfect as possible, yet beekeepers feel treating is responsible. That's my point of view. Um, well, it, it, dogs aren't necessarily a good example because you get things like, um, like pugs and French bulldogs and stuff that are, which it's, kind of good to see some breeding organizations now are banning those dogs with extremely short noses because they they suffer so much in their life because they can't breathe they they snore when they're awake my my brother has a french bulldog and it's it's kind of it's kind of sad yes so if you're treating you are you are propping up a defective um you're propping up a def defective colony, and you're you're giving it a chance to breed when in nature it would die and not breed. Failed amateur beekeeper in UK, six colonies. Any feel for what number of mites can an untreated colony tolerate? Uh, as far as tolerating, according to Robin's research, it seems like the drop off happens at about 8%, eight percent, eight mites per hundred bees. Anything above that and they don't survive. I can't, uh, Bruce has got a hive with uh, 50 mites, so that'd be 50%. Or, uh, I don't know what the numbers were exactly, but very high mite count. He's, he's seeing if it'll survive. I had a colony that had a very high mite count that survived. So again, statistics are statistics. That's when you say the average of something is something, you know, when they say, when you hear on the news about some study says that something is better than something else, you have to realize that there's always a proportion of the population for which things don't work or the, they work the opposite. It's, it's almost never a hundred percent. It also depends what they're carrying as well. They were the deformed wing virus. If they're carrying the worst variant of that, um, 
you've got problems. If there's if the carrying something quite benign, you could live with, you could live with the higher loads, and then it's just down to the actual feeding of them and how many of the breed are um, getting damaged because you've got um, extra mites in, in the place. Um, the thing that gets me about mite counts is that it's not it's like what we were talking about earlier. It's uh, it's not a representative sample. If you just randomly grab 300 bees, um, you may you may be taking bees that don't have any mites on them. Most of the phoretic mites will be on the nurse bees because they're looking for a they're looking for a channel back to the brood. So if you take if you take your sample from workers, you'll have a lower mite count. Uh, also, the timing is very important. Because if you do, you could do your mite count uh, two weeks apart, all the mites could be in the cells and then the, the, bee, the bees emerge and all the mites come out. So you'd get a huge, a huge mite count. But the actual amount of mites in the hive is the same. You're just catching it at the points when the mites are uh, phoretic. Also, you could you could have a point where you've been broodless and all the mites are phoretic. Your mite count will seem very high, but it's just because there hasn't been any open open brood for them to go into. So mm -hmm. just having this blanket thing that if you take three hundred bees, such percent is good, such percent is bad. Again, it has to be absolutely standardised which bees you take them from, and what time in the cycle of the mites you take them from. Uh, and then you've got the thing that the mites are increasing with the brood. You'd always have a low mite count in, in March, April, May. It's always going to be high at the end of the year. So the, the, there just can't be this percent is good, this percent is bad. And I've had hives that are absolutely infested. Every frame you look at, you're seeing the mites crawling over them. And those hives have survived. And then other hives that have died from mites and I haven't seen the mites. The usual idea is that if you if you see mites, you're high, you've got a high count. Um, you might just be lucky. You might just have good eyesight. There's a, there's just too many variables. Well, I've I've argued with people the same thing about COVID with uh, with statistics. First of all, just because you don't feel sick doesn't mean you're not sick. Secondly. Uh, yeah, 90, 97% chance that I'll survive. But what if I'm 3%? What if I'm in that 3%? That's, I don't, you don't know. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and again, the, the best, um, the best, um, the best, the best statistics to look at for COVID are the ones where they've taken millions of people and just tested them regardless. Yeah. Because most of the people have been getting tested. Well, I don't know what it's like in America, but um, if you want, a, you can't just get a COVID test here. You have to have symptoms. You have to tick two or three boxes of the symptoms before they'll test you, which means that the people who are testing already have some kind of symptoms. So you're missing all the people who are asymptomatic. That's generally the same here. The only way that you can get tested without symptoms is if you need a test for something specific. Like if you have a doctor's appointment, they want you to have they want you to be tested before you go to your doctor's appointment. So I've been tested three times because of that. Right. At the moment, we're we're running from the randomised test. We're running at um, I think one in thirty in the worst areas and. Scotland is one hundred of all people. Interesting, and, and that's the best. Uh, I think that's the best thing is, is just you round up a million people and you just test them all regardless. But anyway, this is a bit off, off yeah. topic. <laughs> just out of curiosity, do you know how many uh, vaccines you guys have distributed so far? Uh, five million. Five million. Well, shoot. But that is only the, there's only half a, half a million have had uh, the second dose, but five million have had the first dose. 
I think we're – I forget the numbers. Scotland's a lot worse. We're above 10 million, but we're also a much bigger country. And Scotland have been um, – Scotland have been vaccinating uh, – people in homes first, whereas England have been doing it um, just to kind of blanket wide. So people are complaining that over 80s haven't had it in Scotland, whereas England is just about done. But they're trying to get the numbers up rather than the cost. So anyway, question. Uh, Janice, or maybe if it's Finland, it might be Janis. There are not saying beekeeping in southern climate in Finland. Cold climate are pressure for colony to survive. On the other hand, it can help brood stop. Yeah, I've, I've beekeeping is such, because honeybees exist from the equator to at least as high as southern Alaska, naturally, um, you're going to have wide differences in what bees are capable of and what they require and what they like to do. So definitely all beekeeping is local. You want to, I'm not an omni beekeeping expert. I'm just sharing my experience. I'm here. My latitude is about, I'm about 43 degrees, a uh, very mild climate here. Cause I'm so close to the ocean. Um, so tick, Take what take what works for me, and remember that it might work different for you in your area. So pay attention to that and get more advice from from people local to you. So that you know, I'm just some random internet dude. I'm as trustworthy as any random internet dude. Might load varies with colony state and much more. Was hoping you would say that untreated colonies never show more than a few mites. I failed because too soft to see sick bees. Uh, no, untreated colonies, some of them die of mites. And then they don't die anymore because they're dead. But yeah, the, the, the worst mite situations that I've seen... I haven't had one of my colonies, my my adapted colonies, die of a of a massive mite collapse since I don't know, since about ten years. I can't tell you exactly, but it's been a while. The hives that I the colonies that die of a huge mite collapse are ones that I've caught as swarms, and that's why I say you know catch swarms. They're freebies. Um, it doesn't really matter where they come from. You'll still get to do all the beekeeping stuff until they die, and then they're going to leave you with a nice colony full of honey and comb that you can use to catch more bees with. So I, there's just no downside to me. People, people have got to to enjoy beekeeping. You got to put a lot less emphasis on hives dying. It's just not that important. Happy to do it. Does anybody have any requests for what time we should do this next week? I'm, good. I'm trying to trying to do different times throughout the day so that people have opportunities. I was going for the East Coast lunch crowd today. This is bad for me because I, I just came in to get my tea at 5 o'clock. Yeah. And then this is all going on, so... I wasn't expecting that at all. Well, thanks for joining me, Rupert. It's really good to have you on. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, is it, do, you, do you know how many people there are? Uh, there's been mid-20s. There's about 27 right now. So not a huge crowd, but a good little crowd. Evening, I guess so. Lunch crowd on the East Coast, evening crowd in the UK. 
I guess it's a pretty good time. The, the, there doesn't seem to be many West Coast people other than me. Unless people have Friday off. Hi, Ben. Where are you in the UK, are you? There's a delay, so let's see if I get... Yeah. Five o'clock is when we get our... Um, well, for for me, I get my news that tells you all about what's been happening and all the COVID statistics. And where Lincolnshire. Oh, cool. Robin Hood country, I think. Is it? <laughs> I am. That's oh, good. I think I think it's uh, I think it's a bit wet down there. Right now, most of that part of England's flooded. Five p.m. Central, which would be three p.m. here. I did that. I think I did that two weeks ago. Uh, so my my claim to fame in my local area is. I live right next to the Rogue River here in Southern Oregon. Uh, the Oregon, the the Applegate Trail, which is the the southern branch, one of the southern central southern branches of the Oregon Trail from the mid eighteen hundreds, crosses either crosses my property or it, it was somewhere between the river and. The hill here and my property takes up 900 feet of that so somewhere here is is the the applegate trail crossed through here i believe that natural beekeeping can solve many today's beekeeping problems but the most important thing is that in every okay if you're a religious person we definitely welcome you i try to tailor my message so that it doesn't exclude anybody but not really try to be as ecumenical as possible to include everyone all right well that's about an hour and a half for today uh, I've got some more work to do I'm going to try and edit some video and get some things posted today so Thanks, Rupert, for joining me. Thank you, f all no of the rest of you, for your good questions, a good discussion. And I will try to schedule these one of these again for next week. Stand by on the Facebook group or Patreon for an announcement of when the next one will be. Yeah, good questions. Thanks, everybody.